Praise God this morning on this uh, Father's Day that we are able to praise the Lord. Amen. Happy Father's Day and happy Trinity Sunday. On this day, we celebrate the one triune God we represented, but the person of the Creator, Father God, Redeemer, Son Jesus Christ, and the newly celebrated last week, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the spirit that we have received as believers when we are baptized into the Christian life. We give thanks to God for our fathers, biological and spiritual fathers. And we give thanks to God for sending the Holy Spirit, the quiet whisper of God that seeks to encompass our lives. I also want to thank God for our senior pastor, Dr. Bowie, in extending this invitation to, to me to bring the work of the Holy Spirit through me to God's people today. Sir, thank you for all you have done in my life, in my growth spiritually, and as a person. I also want to thank my wonderful colleagues, especially those who are here with me today wonderfully assisted me in every way possible, Pastor Turnley, and you, ma'am, Reverend Larkin. To my other colleagues who are not here this morning, Pastor Benton and Pastor Parker, know that I love you, and uh, as Dr. Bui said, there's nothing you can do about it. You're probably watching out there, so thank you. To the staff of St. Luke, wonderful staff of St. Luke, to each one of you, to this congregation who have welcomed me on my very first day, to each one of you parishioners who, even though never understood how I spoke from the pulpit, as a parishioner came to me just last week, knowing that I was moving to my next assignment. He said, Pastor, I really never understood what you said, but I love you anyway. <laughs> I thank God for your kind spirit that offered to me and my family in this community. And last but not least, I thank my wife and children who have been my rock and my solid foundation. They teach me each day how to be real and authentic, a better husband and father. They make my ministry better as I try to preach what I live. The reading today, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 8. Would you stand with me as we read together? I believe in the power of reading the scripture together as Brother Wiggins has shared since the 1980s. We have been reading and studying the scriptures together. Amen. Let us read together this morning. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we are peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that our suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at the dry time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly there to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We 
have believed to be a church that reads their Bible together. I chose today to ask, if you brought your Bible, just raise up your Bible. Not cell phone, just Bibles. Just Bibles. Amen. Amen. There is power in this book. Now, cell phone is kind of a microwave faith. Cell phone is good when you go to your workplace and they probably don't want you to bring your Bible there. Nobody care about your Bible at your workplace. But Bible is still for church. Amen? I think I can say that because you won't be able to say anything about that anyway. So we give thanks to God. But I truly believe in my heart I will not say that if it weren't so. Let us pray. Father God, please help all preachers to remember that as long as we preach the truth of your word, we cannot fail. We praise and glory you for allowing us the honor to participate in your magnificent mission. So dear God, please forgive us and give everyone who preaches on this Sunday a spe special measure of your grace and strength. Use me as well, O oh Lord, and this congregation as we bring together your work alive. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's one thing that I said out of the many good things I take from St. Luke. Um, one bad thing I said I take from St. Luke, which is these glasses. My eyesight has gotten a little worse and I have defied going to the doctors. But I promise Dr. Bowie I will go to the doctors and have my eye checked. In today's modern society, the use of the microwave has become one of our standard kitchen tools, a necessity in most homes, and has redefined what is considered to be fast food. Microwave redesigns how family prepare meals and how food was purchased, and even what was essential for a college dorm. Microwaves make meal prep fast, convenient, and almost foolproof. I'm not going to ask you to say foolproof, but one time, can you say foolproof? F-O-O-L, proof. <laughs> Modern day believers desire the same characteristics of their faith that they receive from their microwave. We want our faith to be fast, convenient, and almost foolproof. We want to attend church and spend the next week fasting off that meal. Rewarming up beads of eats as is needed, but only what we remember to take home and not if it reheats well. Our microwave faith mentality is a reality that has deceived even the hardcore believers. In Matthew 24, verse 4, Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am Messiah and will deceive many. The way to fight against false teachings is being in a classroom learning the sound doctrine. So what do we miss when we microwave our faith or our food? Full disclaimer, I do not have anything against microwaves. When my wife Tony and I removed the microwave from our home just over three and a half years ago it was because we found ourselves relying on it for quite a bit more than we desired. You know, the regular busy lives we find ourselves in. At the time, we, between the two of us, we had three jobs. Kids had ballet, church choir, children's choir, church Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and, and you know the list goes on and on and on. I'd like to suggest today that a microwave faith leaves us hungry, not merely for real food, but for wholenessness, wholesomeness of a home-cooked meal. Microwave faith is what makes us 
anemic Christians, while the robust follower of Jesus feasts regularly at the table of the Lord. If we face it, anybody can call themselves Christian, but few are true followers. A follower wakes up in the morning and asks God, how can you use me today to bring your kingdom on wherever, whoever I am today and whoever I meet? A follower longs to be in the presence of the Lord. A follower wants to have a closer walk with the Holy Spirit. A follower recognizes that sufferings are part of life, but they will not, by all means, be the ones causing the sufferings. A follower finds no excuse to act on God's command. A follower stands, spends time with Jesus. And I will come back to this at the end. The text this morning relies on the assumption of the knowledge that all of us know that we have been justified through faith as the bedrock of our existence as followers of Jesus Christ. As you hear, I'm not talking about Christians, nor am I talking about believers, but I'm only talking about followers of Jesus Christ. Christians are many. They know what to do, but find all the excuses in the book not to do it. They say, I don't have to go and meet my brothers and my sisters in the church and try to look at every channel in the television and podcast to find out what the best sermon will come from to help their spiritual life. And so I believe us in Christ, by the way, who just learn enough to act and speak as if they are all in, when in reality they are not. My brothers and my sisters, what happened to Sunday school in the United Methodist Church? Why Christians are so submits to you that why Christians hate Sunday school so much they do not attend it. United Methodists today in our congregation will find all the excuses they can find to not attend Sunday school. Some of the excuses are, and you know, probably, one of the excuses is time. I cannot commit more than three hours to God on a Sunday morning. Are the excuse maybe space? Others feel like, I know everything. I can pick up the Bible and read in my home. Others may say, there are not in enough interesting teachers that I can learn from. And each one of us has their own excuse if you have not attended Sunday school. And the list goes on and on and on. If I had time today, I will make an argument that Christians hate Sunday school because in most church today, people flock into the worship experience as their primary source of spiritual formation. News flash. It is not. Sunday worship is a celebration, not necessarily a learning process. Yes, we sing. And yes, we give a tenth of what God has allowed us to have. However, there is no theological or intellectual engagement taking place there. There is, no, there is encouragement and guidance, however. And we wonder why we have many Christians and few followers. Even the best, best preachers in the business today among us cannot provide a meal feed to feed us for the week or the meat. We followers need to continue to grow. Sunday school, Christian formation, provides a believer with the tools necessary to feast for the week. So why are we, so many in church today, content to have microwave faith? Let us play the games of what ifs, shall we? What if everyone today, all of us in this community, all of us worship at this morning, this 8 and 11 o'clock celebration, 900 plus worshipers in the sanctuary went to Gertrude Francis or the Good News Sunday School class. By the way, I've been there. They allow for class participation, which is very good. As a trained teacher, 
Nothing delights me more than having a good class discussion in the lessons at the hand. And the people there in that class, they practice radical hospitality. Every guest that comes in is given the place of honor, and I can attest to that. And some of you today may be part of the Gertrude Sunday School class members. Please let someone, let someone sitting next to you know and invite them to your class today. Can you imagine if Gertrude Francis Sunday School class birthed another Gertrude Francis Sunday School class, but this time for the young adult? Well, friends, I've been there, and the food is really, really good. I love eating, if you already have not noticed that. What if all of the fathers, both biological and spiritual, engaged themselves in Sunday school programs that our United Methodist Churches offer so that our biological and spiritual children, youth and young adults, can learn from their life and spiritual experience today? How men will raise their hand and say after this sermon, I will go, Lord, send me, as Isaiah raised his hand and say, I will go, Lord, send me. How men will hear this sermon and will despise the messenger as well as the message? Friends, here are the benefits of this text today. The benefit of knowing that we are justified by faith vis-a-vis -vis the wisdom of being justified by faith is perseverance. In other words, consistency. One would say, more like Kawhi Leonard. Yeah? Never too high. Never too low. He was injured, set out for one year. But he persevered. We go to church on Sunday when things are really good. And I've learned quickly that people, when things are really good in their life, they don't go to church. Some people. But when things are really bad, we want to go to church. And I call somebody. And it's okay. That's what church is for. In the end, this young man was able to triumph against all odds. Kevin Durant. Clay Thompson. And my son's role model in sports world, Steph Curry. <laughs> Who would have thought Kawhi Leonard would have won? But he persevered. He probably did not know, but he, he put in the work. It was not a one month. It was the full year. It was not a microwave work. It was tough work. I can only pray for Kevin Durant, that he will, I know as a brother, he will come, strong, come back strong and delight the entertaining world again. And the haters and the lovers, they both will enjoy once again the greatness of Kevin Durant. So I pray as for you. As Kawhi was able to take this group of friends to the mountaintop experience of the basketball world, we wonder ourselves, what are we missing as Christians in our lives that we are not able to take a group of friends with us to the top of the spiritual formation in this church and in our United Methodist churches? Justified faith is spelled victory in Christ Jesus, our risen Savior. Justified faith is wisdom to learn and love for God. Justified faith is no lesser our deficiencies, is to lessen our deficiencies and rely on God's grace and love. Justified faith is to know that you are not alone in the journey we call faith. You are walking with none other than the Savior of the universe. That should give us pause, and we should be thankful that God allowed Jesus to walk with us. But just by faith is not fast, convenient, or foolproof. It takes time to learn, to grow, to marinate in the Word of God. You can't microwave justification. For those of you 
who grew up Methodist and have learned the Methodist way, you know, justification is so big, I could end the sermon right here. We have been justified by God's grace. But if I don't know, I'll never understand God's grace, nor will I love God as he intends to be loved. In verse 8, say, God says, demonstrates God's love towards us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My dad once say, said, knowledge is important, but wisdom is special. It's something really special. Reading books or even studying the book, the Bible, does not give you wisdom. Wisdom is acting on the knowledge you have just acquired. Unless you have a microwave faith. The writer this morning implied that anyone can walk and talk their faith in Christ. Anyone can read the book. But the real test comes in the form of human sufferings. Meaning being human is hand and glove of being justified by faith. Even when you thought progress has been made here in the city of Dallas, Dallas mayor, Dallas city manager, Dallas DA, Dallas police chief. Even when you thought you have reached the top of the mountain, you are reminded that you still have to fight, that you still have to march, that you still have to protest, that you still have to go out there Friday night and say no to injustice. How many times have you felt that you have reached the top of the mountain and yet you think that even as you reach the mountain top, there is more suffering and there is more work to do. Human suffering comes in various forms, and I'm not going to go through that. Each one of us know somebody maybe this morning going through some kind of suffering. But know that suffering produces perseverance. In knowing we have justified, we've been justified by faith. Perseverance produces character when you know you are justified by faith. And character, hope, when you know you have been justified by faith. Truth be told, for those who have been justified by faith, the best is yet to come. And we say that as a cliche, but truly the best is yet to come. Because you already have conquered through Jesus Christ. Jesus knows your beginning and your last. If you hang on, he will be with you even to the end. And hope, verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has, be, who has been given to us. Last Sunday we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. I, growing up, did not understand what the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit worked. I hated the charismatic church because they didn't speak in tongues. And then I learned later on that those were not the tongues, the tongues that Acts 2 was talking about. They were speaking Portuguese. They were speaking Spanish. They were speaking Arabic. They were speaking English. They were speaking in all languages possible. Those are the tongues. And people were able to hear the message that God had for them in their own language. Unfiltered, one would say. Briefly, my brothers, let us examine the human suffering, perseverance, courage, and hope. Faith comes through hearing the word we have heard. Yes, as we hear the word, our faith grows. Today, the church has become this microwave church, however, where believers have developed a faith in a microwave social mentality. Some of us came here this morning, forgot our Bibles, and brought our cell phones. I will ask myself a rhetoric question. What it takes for me to bring my Bible to church? Is that hard for me to carry my Bible to church? 
Or is it because I know everything in this Bible that I don't need the Bible anymore? Or am I ashamed of the Word of God? What is so hard? As you see, I may be a young man, but I'm an old soul. <laughs> Some of us believe in being old school. I can hear that. I am old school. And it's okay if you say Pastor Tyang is old school. I can hear in modern circles or cycles this now getting into a microwave and telling me, that's not right, Pastor. I don't need to bring my Bible. My cell phone is, is my Bible. Nothing against millennials. Pastor, you cannot do that. That's just so naive. I don't have time for that. I have more important things to do on Sunday than bring my Bible to church or attend Sunday school. After all, I work the whole week, and Sunday is the only day that I have for myself, to myself. I hear that. Do you hear that? Yeah. Suffering, perseverance, character, and hope are not built in microwave faith. These are produced and built weekly in Sunday school. They will become daily in the end, and will proclaim the Paul's gospel in Galatians 2.20. Now I'm no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. We expect instant results all the time, but we know there will be results favorable to the followers of Jesus Christ and to those who wait upon the Lord. Those who wait patiently, they will benefit of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I pray to God for more Sunday school classes to be birthed in our churches all across United Methodist denomination and also distant future. And maybe, and maybe, maybe God will allow for us to have more Sunday school class even here at my beloved St. Luke. Some of you may be thinking to yourselves, what must I do? to become a Sunday school attendee or a Sunday school facilitator? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Look up onto my right, and you'll see Pastor Velda Turnley go speak to her after the worship celebration. As we stand on these just five faith, let us keep, keep pace with the transforming world. Let us allow ourselves to see the need in us to be the mindful, to be mindful of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us be courageous enough to marinate our life in Christ. Let me say that again. Let us be courageous enough to marinate our life in Christ. For in due time, he will give us the fruit that we long for on this part of the earth and in the world to come. Let us invest in the eternal. Indulge me for just a second as I conclude. I want each one of you who have a cell phone, just get your cell phone now, please. It takes about 30 seconds. I will show you the benefits of this sermon today. Go to your browser, on your internet browser, internet browser, and type one word, scripture union, scripture union dot org. Thank you, guys and girls. Some of you are there. The internet may be really, really slowing down now because everybody's on the internet. We are working on that. Amen. Scripture union dot Org. While I was in Africa, I got books from Scripture Union. They helped me quite a bit. I did not. They were on the internet. Until recently, about a couple of years ago, I found that they were on the internet. Choose a reading. Read it daily to the end of the month. This is my only request of you. Read it daily to the end of the month. 
I invite you. I don't mean to patronize you, but it's my only and last request of you. Trust me, my sister and my brother. If you do, one reading a day takes about three minutes. If you do, your life will change. I promise you that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And wherever you are in your work of life, maybe, just maybe, you too will become a follower of Jesus Christ. Microwave faith is fast, it's convenient, it's foolproof, but God wants our faith to be a long life journey, to be inconvenient and messy. I encourage you to feast in our our Sunday school class today. You had plans before you came here today. But I invite you, feast on one of our Sunday school classes today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.